We're beside a typical smallmouth stream in mid-state Virginia. We're going to be fishing for these smallmouth because many of us see the smallmouth as a gentleman of the warm water species. I'll show you some of my secrets of the ways we analyze the stream, where we decide where the fish will be, how the fish will react to different water conditions. The ripple on the far side is very, very appealing to the bass. They like that oxygen and it gets ground into it. There's a tremendous amount of food below that riffle. The boulder here in front of us would be a typical place that a bass might hold. They like a good strong current, but they like something to block that current. So they might lie in front of the boulder, they might lie beside it, picking up any food that's drifting down. The heavy runs in the middle of the stream would be appealing. There are lots of minnows out there, there are lots of nymphs out in there. Then after we'd fish this, then we could run over and hit those grass beds. The grass beds on the far side hold a great population of minnows. The bass go into those areas primarily in the morning and evening to feed on those. Any low light level, but primarily morning and evening is the time you'd expect to find those bass in the grass beds. For my personal smallmouth fly fishing, I like a nine foot graphite rod that has a pretty strong tip, live right medium to a flexible butt section, with a floating line, single action reel that'll hold my weight forward seven floating bass bug taper line. Then in the spring and in the fall, I'll go to a sinking tip line. In the spring, I get a whole lot of water and I need to punch through it. In the fall, I get cold water and I need to punch down to where they are. So I've got an extra spool for my single action reel. I just push the button, take that out, slip this in, go down to the greater depths. Now, on my sinking tip line, I use a six foot leader, again, to take advantage of that sinking tip going down, which pulls the leader down. On the floating line, I'm using a nine foot leader taper down to about two X or three X. The water in front of us here is typical riffle type water. A lot of cobblestones on the bottom. Great many sculpin minnows here. I'm gonna fish this with the Murray Mad Tom sculpin, which mimics both of these. The Murray Mad Tom sculpin is my favorite pattern to match the natural sculpins. These are effective from early March all the way into late October. The natural sculpins live under the cobblestones right in the riffles. They require fairly well aerated water. They run a good current. The thing to keep in mind on the sculpins is that these are bottom hugging minnows. The mad toms, that thing looks like a baby catfish is a bottom hugging minnow. So what we're gonna do is cast out across that, try to swim our fly just as deeply as we can. Very, very little manipulation. With the slower we can fish it, the deeper we can fish it, the more fish we catch. So we want to run our fly right across the bottom, trying to make it look like a real sculpin. Just try to swim it just as deep as you can. The slightest hit of a strike, you set the hook. You never assume you've hit the bottom, you feel any kind of bump, you set the hook. Just a slight mend to keep it coming across the current, perpendicular to the current. If there were a little extra water in here beside what you're seeing, I'd consider using a sinking tip line. I particularly like the sink tip three lines. They get down real quickly. But I think with this depth of water, I can cover it with a floating line. Don't want to make real long cast here because you'll miss a lot of the strikes. Now see, he hit right up under the riffle. Had I made, I'm probably making about a 40 foot cast there. But had I make a real, real long cast up under that riffle, I may have gotten that strike and not known it.
That smallmouth would be probably about, oh, about a three, four-year-old smallmouth. But he'll get much larger and he'll feed more aggressively. As they get older, they're not as easy to fool as these little ones. But that's the typical smallmouth you'll find in a lot of these drainages. After covering this water with the sculpin pattern, I'm going to turn and do the same thing here. Again, sculpins are on the bottom here. We're going to use the Murray's Mad Tom sculpin. Fish it very, very close to the bottom, very slow retrieve. The slower the better for two reasons. The slower I move it, the deeper it's going to run. The slower I move it, the more appeal it has to the big fish. Now obviously, well there's one and one to play suicide right in front of us. See, I told you they like the sculpin, but obviously this is good Helgramite water too. Now that's a little rock bass. He was lying right here in front of us. The rock bass will often be in a little bit slower water, whereas the smallmouth will be in a little bit heavier water. But the rock bass is a good fish for a fly rod angler because they take flies just as readily as the bass do. This water is typical smallmouth water in a blower riffle, well aerated. They like that oxygen. We're going to fish that with that sculpin pattern just right across the bottom. The deeper I can fish it, the slower I can move it, the more fish I'm going to catch. Now obviously there are going to be a lot of helgramites in here. The larva of the Dobson fly, we could just as well be using that. I'm, I used to seine this water and I know there are a lot of sculpins in here. so. I'm going to use a sculpin pattern. Got some grass. I've got to bring that back and get the grass off of it. They will not hit the fly with grass on it. I'm running a few streamers right in front of those boulders, and you'll notice I have the rod tip pointed right down the line. That's so I can feel the strike, and once I feel it, it's so I can set that hook. You always want your rod tip pointed right down the line where the line is coming out of the water. I'm trying to run it in front of those boulders in hopes that it'll be a couple smallmouth lying in either in front of or beside. But notice how I'm following that drift with the line tip coming right out of the water. I don't want it way upstream and I don't want it way downstream. Right where the line's coming out, two reasons, strike detection and then also setting the hook. Don't need a lot of false cast with this. Now there I'm getting a little drag, so I'm going to mend it upstream, but still again, I've got to pick that mend up, have the rod tip pointed right down the line. I let it swing down below me. Once it gets below me, I pretty much pick it back up, drop it to another spot a foot or two down the stream. I never cast back the same place twice. You just can't, can't pound the smallmouth up. If he sees it, likes it, he's going to take it. You, you could show it to him 40 times, and if he didn't take it on the first time, he usually isn't going to take it on the 40th. If he's too smart for you, go find a dumb one. So basically, I'm going right down the middle of the river, shooting in both directions. There's a boulder there I'm going to run it in front of, swimming it across the bottom just as slowly as I can swim it. Come back over here, there again, down and across, and I'm ready for that strike right away. I'm tight in these fingers and I'm tight with that left hand. I might not hook them all, but I'm going to know they're there. I'm still using my sculpin pattern. I'm running it right along the bottom. A lot of time those bass will hold right in around those boulders. I'm relying on the current to impart the action to the fly, just trying to pump it right along beside that, beside that ledge. Same thing back on this side. He might be back along in there. Give him a couple shots. If he's there, I'll get him. If he's not there, he's too smart for me. So I'm going to go back down and across, swimming across these little runs. Another fish holding over on that far side. Smallmouth really like the low light level we have this morning. I want to fish that grass bed, but I can't walk away from all these fish doing their thing here. So I'm going to fish this real carefully, and then we'll move over and see if anybody's feeding in that grass bed on the far side, because that's a beautiful grass bed. But I'm going to fish this out carefully, 
When you get on a stream, you systematically look at the water and say, I want to fish that, therefore where do I put myself? Then you cover that and you look at the next area you plan to fish and you carefully move into that. It's, it's very important. Now see, I'm picking those up in water over there that probably isn't two feet deep. And had I directly waded over in there, I would have spooked these fish, although that grass bed does look great. Had I waded over through here, I would have spooked all these fish. So it's important to analyze the stream, get yourself to the right place, and then do what you feel needs to be done. And just to play it safe, before I wait over there, I'm gonna put one up in that little fast current over there just to see if anybody's home. Nope, nobody there. That might be too shallow. Nope, there was somebody there and he got off. Yes, there was somebody back in that shallow. And that's because of this low light level. We've got a heavy overcast day and they're right in there along that fast current. Down and across, rod tip pointed right down the line, trying to feel that strike in my left hand. Trying to feel that strike. And when I do, I'll hit him with the left hand and I'll hit him with the rod just as quickly as I can. Oh, there was one on the edge there. I believe that's a fall fish. And again, the fall fish, fall fish live in the same water, feed in the same way. So if you're in a stream that has a lot of fall fish in it and you're catching fall fish, they're wonderful game fish. And you're doing it the right way because they feed on the same food, they feed in the same water. Everything the fall fish does is exactly what the smallmouth does. It's sort of which one's gonna beat who to the fly. Oops, there was another one. Now that one, the fall fish will usually have a fast first run and then they slow down. But on the first cast, we caused smallmouth. Next two casts, we got fall fish. So it's the same tactic, same fly pattern. Everything's exactly the same. I've selected a silver outcast streamer to fish back against that grass bed because this mimics the shiner minnows that are in there very, very well. Sometimes we'll see those bass actually chasing the shiner minnows. Uh, I haven't seen that. So what I'm gonna do is use this silver outcast streamer, fish it back in there just in hopes that some of the bass will be working along the edge. You don't always see them chasing minnows around the grass. Often they'll just kind of cruise in along the edges of it and pick them up as they go. Now this is an unweighted streamer uh, because we are fishing it in the shallow water. To give myself a little better advantage in setting the hook and hooking them securely, I'm gonna mash the barb down. Now that's a new, new fly right out of the bend at my fly shop, but I'm mashing that barb down. I'm also gonna sharpen it. I'm not gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm gonna get, if, if I goof, I goof. I don't wanna miss a strike because I've got a dull hook. And I'll try to sharpen those hooks about every 15 minutes, get a hold of the fly, get a hold up above the tippet and pull good and tightly. All right, let's see if anybody's back in that grass bed. Now, before I actually drop it back against the grass, I'm gonna work my way along that edge. That water's only about a foot deep. So if they're there, they're there to feed. But I'm gonna work that shallow water, there he was, along the edge. See, shiner minnows could have come in off that side. I, I was probably 10 feet from the grass when he hit it. But see, they'll come out and roam along the edge and hit those minnows, any kind of minnows stray out from home, he's gonna get nailed. So he took my shiner imitation, the silver outcast streamer, uh, probably thinking it was a shiner minnow that got a little too far from home. The shiner minnows in there are very, very important in a food source to these smallmouth. I'm gonna work my way over to it. Now I'm casting, I'm dropping that fly probably 10 feet off that grass because often the bass will hold out along the edge and get any minnow that strays out. So before I actually drop them right back against the grass, I'm gonna check that edge a little further out because once I've weighed in there, I'm gonna spook any of these bass that are here. Oops, and I missed that one. So I, I'm gonna prospect along that edge, seeing if there are any of them out here because once I spook them, that's the end of that. 
Let's put some back a little tighter into the grass. And you, it's important that you be ready for the strike as soon as that fly gets in the water. Because if they're back there, they are there to feed. And many times they'll hit that fly literally within one or two seconds. Drop it back against the grass, get tight to it right away, and swim it out real slowly. Real slowly coming out from the grass. There, that one was lying, oh, he was lying within probably three feet of the grass. But see, they'll come out and roam along the edge and hit those minnows. Anytime minnows stray out from home, he's going to get nailed. Your stream gets up a little bit, gets some discoloration in it. The smallmouth love to go out and roam. It's not that they're finding stuff in that muddy water. What that does for us, that slight turbidity in the water, gives them a little bit blocked from the sun. It could be a bluebird day, but if your, sun is if your stream is slightly discolored, then it filters out that bright sun and those bass can go back into those grass beds and feed like crazy with a little bit discolored water. Whoops, and I missed him. Let's put one back in there real tight. See if anybody's roaming along back in there. Now, the ongoing question is how close can I get to it and not spook it? Well, I don't know the answer there. I'd like to try to get within 40 or 50 feet of them, sometime even less, because I don't want to stand here and make a 60-foot cast back in there, because I know I'm going to miss more fish than I'd really like to with those real long casts. The time that we go to the real long cast is in the summer, late summer, when the streams get real, real low. Then often we'll use an upstream approach to keep from scaring them, We'll make a long cast to make, keep from scaring them. But you never want to make a longer cast in smallmouth fishing than the situation dictates, simply because you're going to miss a lot of your strikes. Standing here, double haul and rip your underwear and send it out there 100 feet is foolish because you're going to miss a lot of those strikes. OK, we've pretty much covered the edge of that grass bed. I'm going to keep this fly on, work a little bit tighter back in there. Then we'll turn and come back out with another pattern in the middle. I'm going to fish a dry caddis fly down through this water beside us. I see some rising fish down there. Got a little silicone cream I put on my fingers. I'm going to rub it into the fly to help get the fly up on top. Put a little bit on the leader up to about midsection. Now, caddis flies tend to dance around on the top when they're taking off. They tend to, when they come back to lay eggs, they're bebopping all over the stream. So I'll fish them upstream dead drift with the caddis, but basically I like to go down and across stream, get him up on his toes and just give him a little wiggling, not like we do a skater, but just give him a little action on the current. Part of that is I'm trying to mimic the action of a real caddis fly just bouncing along on the surface. Part of it, I'm trying to get the fish's attention. But just a very, very slight angle down and across. I'm setting myself up so the good water is down and across about a 45 degree angle. Drop it on the water, just give it a little twitch. Oh, there he is. He hit it just as soon as I twitched it. A uh, lot, of, lot of fall fish will go for these dry flies. The small mouth will go for them. Usually, the peak of the caddis hatches on most streams are going to be May, June, that type thing, sometimes as early as April. We had a real long, warm spring several years ago, and we had wonderful caddis hatches in March, and the fishing was just outstanding. But uh, you seldom will catch a lot of big fish on them, but it's a fun game. And there again, I set myself up casting down and across stream, drop it on the water. Whoop, he took it. I didn't even have to twitch it. I dropped it on the water. It was like he was sitting there with his mouth open. But see, I saw some of these fish coming up down through here, so in a way, maybe we're cheating a little bit. We get a lot of good dry fly hatches on most of our smallmouth streams, late May and early June and even into July. A real variety. Some of them are in the brown range. Some of them are in the olive range. I've got a size 10 irresistible on here. 
What we do there is the same thing you do on a trout stream in the Adirondacks or the same thing you do on a trout stream in the Rockies. You can fish upstream just covering the water like I'm doing here, or if you see a trout rise or a smallmouth rise, you put it right over into that, above that rise for him and run it to him, and I missed him. Let's go back over and see if he's got a roommate now. He won't come back, but whatever was appealing to him might be appealing to another fish. Swing nymphing, I'm casting upstream, giving it time to sink, getting my rod tip up in the air and swinging right along, trying to feel, feel, feel that strike. I don't know if it was the bottom of the fish. Take a little baby step down, and remember now, the hot spot I'm setting myself up, I'm fishing right here in front of me. Deep water, fast water, casting up into the current, give it a time to sink. That time's gonna depend on how fast and how deep that is. I've got my rod tip up in the air, swinging ahead of it, trying to feel that strike, feel, feel, feel. Didn't even bump the bottom that time, so I probably didn't get deep enough. Same thing up into the current. Now you don't pick it up right away. Let it get down in there. Then you get straight to it. Don't know, could have been the bottom, could have been a rock, could have been a fish. But you hit him just as quickly as you can. This will get you deeper than anything that I know you can do with a floating line. Now you could use a sinking tip line here, but a lot of times we don't have it in our vest, we're too lazy to put it on, you're gonna be fishing poppers downstream, so you just don't wanna put your sinking tip line. You could do it down and across with the sinking tip line, but this is very effective. This is the same technique we use in a lot of the large western streams for trout. Madison River, we do this for miles and miles and hours and hours but you're trying to run it right down his throat and feel the strike. All right, I'm using an olive strimp at the S-T-R-Y-M-P-H, olive strimp in about a size six. I've gone to that because I know there are a lot of dragonfly, damselfly nymphs in here and a lot of minnows that that'll imitate. I've cast right across that current swimming back across the grass beds and across the ledges. He hit it coming right across the grass beds. The advantage of the strimp is the way we tie it. It enables you to fish it upstream or downstream. Retains a lot more motion than a pattern tied with just marabou. Marabou, of course, is excellent if you can keep working it downstream. Uh, but if you've got to go upstream with marabou, it's going to lose a little of its action. In fact, it'll fall right back down over the fly. Now I'm used going down and across, looking at those ledges out there, rod tip pointed right down the line and swimming that strimp right through those cuts between the ledges, over the little grass beds, tr expecting to strike at any moment. I can't pinpoint where that bass is gonna be, so I'm just ready for him any time. Pick it up, drop it downstream just a couple feet. See, anybody out there is gonna get a chance to see it. He might be, oh, he might be too smart for me, but he's gonna see it. And that one hit it coming right down between those two deep ledges. Not deep water out there, hip deep probably, maybe a wee bit more than hip deep. And that's a fall fish. And again, whatever we're doing on the fall fish is the right thing. I've put a crayfish pattern on here Crayfish often are at their best worked back against the shallows where the natural crayfish would hold. Where you've got cobblestones, whoa, and he, we rolled him, but we didn't land him. Cobblestones along the bank are really the habitat for a lot of crayfish. They'll be under rotten wood, they'll be under cobblestones, but remember, they're bottom huggers. So what you want to do is go down and across, drop it in the water that you think would hold them, and just ease it along the bottom. I thought I had a strike there, but either I missed it or he missed me. Down and across, just real slowly. And again, since you know that the crayfish are actually living on the bottom, you want your fly to be on the bottom if you can get it there. You don't want to hang up. Oops, and I missed another one. But if you could fish your pattern just inches off the bottom, that's where you'd expect to catch the fish. There are a lot of good crayfish patterns out there. 
Historically, we found those with the greatly exaggerated pinchers don't do as good a job like the one Bob Clouser has is an excellent pattern. Those with the, that are so pretty with greatly exaggerated pinchers that look like you'd be afraid to pick them up, those don't usually do as good a job as the more subtle patterns, especially like the one Bob has. I've got one of Bob Clouser's on here, and it's, it's probably my favorite of all the crayfish. Drop it in, get ready right away. Oh, he hit and he ran, he missed. There's one right beside him, right down along the bottom. Now these are fall fish back in here, but the small mouth, I think actually the small the fall fish are so greedy and they're beating the small mouth to it. The ideal time for a lot of smallmouth fishing is early in the morning and late in the evening. Ideal water temperatures would range from 55 up to maybe 85. The appeal early in the morning and late in the evening is the low light level. Smallmouth bass just do not like real bright sunlight. So what they're going to do is feed when that light level is lower. Another thing that we take advantage of uh, is the shade along the banks. They may not feed very aggressively in the middle of the stream in the middle of the day, but if they've got a good shaded bank, they'll usually feed quite well all day. Smallmouth fishing generally starts in the latter part of March and early in April, stays good on most of the mid-Atlantic areas until about the uh, middle of October, late October. We adapt our tactics to the water level, to the water conditions, to the food that's available to the fish. In the spring, a lot of times, if there's high water, we'll be using nymphs, some of the streamers, even on sinking tip line. As the water drops in June and July, then we have the wide spectrum of different lures, different techniques, different patterns that we can use. Usually in October, when the streams get colder, we're relegated to going into the deeper water. The bass will leave the real shallow water, move into water that's from four to, say, six to eight feet deep, then we go under with our sinking flies, the Helgramites, the Clouser streamers, the Murray's Mad Tom, those type flies and fish the deeper water. Sometimes even go into the sinking tip line. The water downstream from where we're standing has a lot of natural chub minnows in it. One of the best flies we have to imitate this is Ed Shank's white streamer. We'll put that on and we'll work down and across with the standard streamer technique. I'll show you how to mend the line, how to detect the strike, how to set the hook with both the left hand and the rod. But the streamer technique down and across is very, very effective in all smallmouth streams. For me personally, I feel it's very important to have my rod tip pointed right where the line's coming out of the water when I'm fishing down and across with underwater flies. This puts me in direct contact with that fly and I can feel the strike just like right there. I felt that both in the rod and I felt it in the line hand. If you're pointing your rod tip at a greatly different angle than where the line is coming out of the water, you can have a cushion in the rod and a cushion in the line and you may not feel the strike. It gives you a better angle to set the hook too because with your rod tip pointed right at it, you can, uh, you can set the hook real quickly. But the smallmouth love the chub minnows. They feed very heavily on them. The chub minnows are distributed throughout a great part of our water drainage. And they're in water just like you're seeing I'm standing in right here. This is where the chub minnows live. If you're undecided about what pattern to use, you can hardly go wrong with a chub imitation, such as the Pearl Marauder, or right here I'm using Ed Shank's white streamer. On the far side of the bank, we've got uh, some tree roots coming out of that large sycamore with sort of a three upper branches. The roots can be appealing. In many cases, the small mouth will hold right in where those roots actually meet the stream. They'll, those roots will actually come out much further than you can see at this angle. And the bass will hold back under the edges of those. That downfall just below it, they'll hold back under there. 
so they'll snuggle back under those things and try to get any overhead cover they can anywhere they can find it. We're going to fish the Murray's Helgramite upstream dead drift. The big advantage of the upstream dead drift approach is that it's going to run the fly right along the bottom where the fish almost has to see it. He might not be inclined to come out and chase minnows in the shallow. He may not be inclined to come up on the surface and take mayflies. But if we can run this Helgramite right by his nose, it may be more than he can withstand and we may catch fish that basically don't even want to feed. Now, the way I like to do it, the whole thing rests in what I do with my left hand and my right hand. Now, I'm talking about upstream dead drift only. As I'm making that presentation cast, turning over, I have not let go of this line in this line hand. I do not drop the line here. I keep that line hand within probably six inches of this hand. As that rod is turning over in the air, I'm taking this line and putting it over one of the fingers of the rod hand. Then as that fly is turning over in the air, I'm going to strip in all of the slack that's in the air. The advantage of that is then when that fly touches the water, I'm tight to it. Then I gauge the rate of my retrieve as how that's drifting down the stream. You're making the cast. You're taking up the slack in the air. You're tight to it. Then you gauge the rate of your retrieve at the rate it's drifting back. The reason this is important is that when you're using upstream dead drift nymphing, you've got to see the strike. Downstream and across with the Helgramite or with the streamers, we're going to feel those strikes. That's duck soup. Popping bugs, you've got them on the top. Dry flies, you've got them on the top. That's duck soup. We shouldn't miss being aware of any of those. But the problem here is that if we do not maintain a tight line from here all the way down to the Helgramite or the Bitch Creek Nymph, if you want to use those, is that you have to be aware of he, that he has it, and the only way to be aware of that is to see that. We use a fluorescent butt leader. We've got a couple scientific anger indicators on here, and we're watching that. In order to do that, we're stripping it very, very carefully with long, steady strips that you'll see me use as that's drifting back in there. The problem is if slack occurs below our indicator, he'll pick it up a second or second and a half. He knows he's made a mistake. He spits it out. We don't even know he's been there. It's not as if I got the strike and I missed the strike. What happens is I get the strike and I don't even know I had the strike. We miss being aware of the strike. It's not just missing a strike. We're missing being aware of the strike. And that's a killer. You cannot catch that fish if you don't know he's got the fly. As I'm making that presentation, I'm taking the line in my left hand and putting it over one of the fingers in the rod hand, and I'm actually taking that slack up before the fly touches the water. As that is passing my ear, I'm over there and I take it up. Then once it's in the water, I'm going to use long, slow, steady pulls. The reason for that is if I use short, bouncy pulls, it'll look to me like a strike, and I'll miss that fish every time. So when the fly rod is coming over in the air, I'm putting it from my left hand into the right, taking that slack up before it even touches the water. Now that doesn't mean I have to race it through the current, but I'm gonna pull at a steady rate determined by how fast that fly is drifting back to me. I'm gonna go out and fish this riffle with our upstream dead drift technique. I'm gonna use my polarized glasses to help me see the strikes when I get them. Now remember, I'm just watching the indicators here, the fluorescent butt of the leader. But the, uh, the polarized glasses are a great help in letting us see under the water. Not so much see the fish, but to see when I get the strikes. So I'm going to wade out below this. I'm going to fish it upstream dead drift with a Helgramite. And then remember, the main thing on the upstream dead drift is how we're handling that line before the fly gets on the water. That's the real secret. Well, let's move out here and see what we can find. And again, it's a more difficult technique because you're relying on seeing those strikes. You cannot wait until you feel these strikes. You've got to see these strikes in order to set the hook before he spits it out. There he is, right where he should have been, right along the very edge of that current. But you can tell that the bass will lie right in there and take it very effectively. Good flies for this, probably my favorite two, would be the Helgramite and the Bitch Creek and maybe Polly Rosenborough's casual dress. That's an excellent nymph.
I use the damselfly popper and fish it around the grass beds. And the second area I like to fish them are around the deadfalls, brush piles, that type thing. Because the damselfly nymph crawls up that blade of grass, gets out on that adult grass, flies away, and then that's also his landing strip. Damselflies and dragonflies start hatching off many smallmouth rivers the latter part of June. They're present along the stream all the way into October. A real hot spot for finding these adult flies is around the grass beds. They buzz along the surface of the stream. A lot of bass will actually leap up in the air and attempt to catch them. Now they seldom catch the dragonfly. They're too good a flyer. But a lot of them do catch the damselfly all as high as maybe six inches above the stream. And if you're looking out in the river and you see bass airborne in the middle of the summer, July, you see them up in the air, the only thing that's up there is damselflies. So you know what that fellow's doing. I figure they catch about a third of them because I have a little game that I look quickly when I see them jump, see if the fly flew away. And yeah, I think they get about a third of them. There's some nice water against the bank downstream of where we are. So I'm gonna try the Shenandoah damsel popper. Now this is a new bug right out of my box. The first thing I do is use my needle nose pliers and mash the barb down. I'm firmly convinced that you land more fish on the barbless hook because you actually hook them back in the bend of the hook. You get him hooked right back in there. With the barb on there, many times they sort of hang on the end of the hook and they're never hooked. But if I can hook them back in the bend, I feel I have them. And even though this is a new bug right out of my box, I turn him over on his back, hold him like that, and sharpen him to create a triangular point. This is just a very, very fine tooth file, and I sharpen them to create a triangular point. Okay, we're gonna fish this damsel popper tight against the bank to try to tease them into striking. Now, the technique I like is going down and across about a 20 degree angle. Instantly, I mend that back up and let it drift with the current. Just give it a little mend and let it drift. What that does is it enables us to get a natural drift without the current grabbing our line and leader and pulling it off the bank. What we're doing is dropping it back against the bank and mending that belly upstream. Mending that back upstream. The main difference between the popper, the slider, and the chugger is the build of the body and the cut of the face. This is the Shenandoah blue popper. The popper has a flat, slightly upsloping face that's capable of a variety of actions. This is the Shenandoah Sunfish Slider that has a pointed nose which enables us to fish it in relatively shallow water with a very gentle teasing action. This is the Shenandoah Gray Scaled Chugger. This creates a lot of commotion uh, below the riffles and in the deep water against the bank because of that cup face. It'll take a lot of bass in those situations. We're gonna cover some of the basic casts we're using in smallmouth fishing. These are not real demanding, but a few simple tricks will help you a tremendous amount. The basic cast for all smallmouth fishing is the forward overhead cast. The first part of this motion, I keep my wrist locked. I do not move that wrist. I come up in this point, snap it back, and then snap it forward. Now, it's right important that right at that point, I put a fair amount of force to it, right at that point. The reason that for that is that I need to excel the line high behind me. I need to put it high in the air behind me. Once I get it up there, then the front forward cast is relatively simple. I just keep pushing with my thumb. The last thing I do is just turn that over. So holding the line tight in my line hand, coming up beside my ear, snap it back with good force, and snap right back out. The one problem that can get to you here is if you drop your rod tip too low on the back cast, the line drops down here, you lose power, and that makes it real difficult. When you're fishing, you're stripping it over the first or second finger of your line hand. Hold it there as you're ready to cast, right up and right straight back. Frequently in fly fishing, there'll be some beautiful water in front of you that you want to cover, but you'll have trees close behind you here. The basic back cast would never work because you'll be in the trees. The cast we use there is a roll cast. A roll cast, you hold the line tight in your left hand, 
you bring your rod tip up to a little bit behind you. At that point, it's important that you stop the flow of the line on the water. That, in essence, becomes your back cast. With your rod tip pointed high and slightly behind you, you just punch out with your thumb. That's the roll cast, and it overcomes any problem here. Sometime in smallmouth fishing, you need a maximum length cast, such as in low water time, spooky situations. You may see a bass chasing minnows way out beyond your normal reach. That's when we go to the double haul. I don't really advocate it under most circumstances, but there are some times that you can use it. Double hauling, you're pulling back here, the line hand comes up, and then you pull forward. The line hand comes up and you pull here. Now let me show you, uh, see I haven't shot it, I'm just showing you how to do it now. Okay, so you're fishing along and you see a bass rise out in here and you want to make your maximum distance. You've got quite a bit of line off here. So you're fishing along here and there he goes, you pull it up here, out you go, and it takes the whole line out. That's the double haul that you would need for the maximum cast. We use it maybe in low water time, late in the summer, to try to prevent scaring the fish. There are so many situations in smallmouth fishing where you want to fish your nymphs or streamers very deeply. These would be heavily weighted flies, you may have a split shot on the line, that type thing, and you want to get them down deeply. Now that can present a casting problem because a heavily weighted streamer or say any of the streamers with lead eyes and maybe even put a split shot in front of them, when you make your back cast, gravity pulls that down. When you make your forward cast, gravity's pulling it down. So as you add more weight to it, that gets to be a problem. The technique that I like to use for that is the one that I learned from old Charlie Brooks out in West Yellowstone, Montana, which he just basically says in low and out high. Now, I'm gonna show you how to do it in this deep pool in front of me. Okay, you've made your regular cast, you've got it out there. You're fishing a fly such as the Murray's Mad Tom, which is very, very heavy. You're fishing it down on the bottom, a conventional back cast, you might hit yourself. So you get tight with your line hand, you come back with your rod hand real low and right straight back out. In low, out high. Now let me do that again. You're fished it down through there, you've gotten through the deep water, you wanna pick it up and go back out again, you just come in low and out high, and that just simply keeps you from hitting yourself in the head. It's a very effective cast, Brooks used it a tremendous amount. Frequently, you'll have a situation that you may see a bass chasing minnows in here. You could conceivably have tree limbs close behind you, which would prevent making that back cast to come out in that direction. The change of direction cast will let you present your fly right straight in front of you, even if there are trees straight behind me and I couldn't make the back cast. In essence, I'm coming up like this. I've made basically the back cast upstream. Then I turn my thumb over and go in like so. I pick, picking it up and I made the standard back cast just as if I'd be casting up and down the stream. That's, that's the basic cast. But at this point, I turn and go in that direction. The rod tip leads the line, and all I have to do is point the rod tip. When we're making longer casts, occasionally our strike is a little slower than we'd like for it to be. We may have a fly down deep, and we may not detect that strike quite as quickly as we could, and we set the hook, and we miss them, miss them, miss them. The best way to compensate for that is try to develop a line hand strike as well as hitting with the rod. Now when you're hitting with the rod, you're lifting the rod. You're not setting the hook on a 14 Adams. That isn't gonna cut it. You just don't simply rotate your wrist and say I'm gonna hook the bass. The basic strike is zap, stick him in the jaw. Now to accelerate that even more, strip here as you set there. All right, let's say I've got that down in the bottom and it's down deep and I think I've got a strike. I'm gonna hit him there and I'm gonna hit him there. In action, I'd be fishing all along. Pow, he hits it, zap and zap. There are many situations on smallmouth rivers where the bass will feed close to the banks under tree limbs hanging down 10, 20, 30 feet out over the river that may come down to within a foot or two of the river. What we need to do is get our fly back under those tree limbs. A conventional overhead cast like that will hang me in the tree limbs every time. What I like to do is just come down close to the stream, use my rod parallel to the water. My whole cast is made right at that point parallel to the stream. I'm back under those tree limbs and I've got my fish. 
Occasionally, in low water conditions, you'll want to make longer casts. That's where we shoot extra line. You pull extra line off your reel. As the line is going forward in the air, you just punch with your thumb. See, I took all of that line up very easily. All I'm doing is just punching with my thumb a little harder. At the very last instant, when it's out there in front of me, I'm going to open those fingers. Now let me show you how that goes. You've got the line up here. I want to make a little longer cast. He's chasing Menace over there. I want to make a little longer cast. Zap, the whole thing went out. In some situations where the streams are carrying a good high water level, but they're still fishable, we pass up our floating lines and go to our sink tip lines where approximately the first 10 to 15 feet of the line sinks pretty quickly or to a high D head where the first 30 feet sinks quickly. That can cause a problem a little bit on picking them up because your fly is down deeply. Rather than make that basic cast, which is very difficult to get it in the air, you use what we call a roll cast pickup. So I've got my, I've got my sink tip down in there. I want to get it up to make my next cast. I come up to this point right in front of me, flip it out, that pulls it up on top, and then out I go. It's sort of like a roll cast, but all I'm using the roll for is to pull it up out of the water and then away I go. This is especially valuable if you're using a 30-foot high D head or something like that where the whole thing is sinking like crazy. You get it back up in here, come to this point, punch out, go back up, and then back out with what it is. It gets the line in the air so you don't have to worry about that weight of the underwater force have a situation against the grass beds where there'd be a number of bass feeding in a relatively small area. Could be against the grass beds, could be against uh, overhanging tree limbs. What we need to do there is to be able to pick our popping bug or chugger up off the water without scaring the fish to death. If we make the conventional rip it up, it throws water every which way. And that would scare any bass that's close by. So the cast I want to show you here is how to pick a chugger or a popper up off the surface without creating a lot of noise. Basically what I'm going to show you is I'm going to start it sliding with my line hand and then begin a very smooth rod hand pickup. Now let's put it on the water and you'll see what I mean. All right, I fished it out there. I didn't get my strike. Now, I want to pick it back up and come on up or down the stream a short distance. With my left hand, I'm pulling that in. I'm, see, I've got my rod tip way out in front of me. I'm picking that up smoothly and just begin a smooth pickup. And that lets you get the popper up off the water without splashing and scaring the fish to death. See, if I do it without that, look, I'm throwing water everywhere. See, if I just make the regular pickup, look at that great big splash I'm making. Well, that's a no-no. I just scared the fins off everybody out there. We're going to start with an empty reel and attach the Dacron backing. Then we're going to attach the fly line, and finally we'll attach the leader. The basic knot for attaching the Dacron backing is the Arbor knot. The backing is either 20 to 30 pound test Dacron. You strip it through the reel spool back out around and pull that out. Then to the very end of the Dacron, I tie a little overhand knot, like so. Then the arbor knot, which secures the line to the reel, is nothing more than a slip knot. Just wrap that right around the standing part of the Dacron. So that's the basic slip knot, which we call the arbor knot. Pull that right down against the reel. Then put firm wraps of that onto the reel. And in most cases in smallmouth bass, we use probably 50 to 100 yards. Whatever the reel will hold, but you don't want so much backing on it that the line actually crashes into the pillars. That would damage the line. Now I just have a short piece of Dacron on here. I would normally be attaching at least 50, 50 yards. Now we're going to attach the fly line to the Dacron backing. The best knot we have for this is the Albright knot. To form the Albright knot, fold the fly line over about three or four inches, just forming a loop in the very end of the fly line. Take the Dacron, stick it through that loop, bring it out about four to six inches. Hold that securely in your line hand and then just wrap that about six or eight wraps back toward the end of that loop. 
go through exactly opposite of the way you came through to start with. See, when we came through, we stuck that through there. We're going to go back exactly opposite of the way we came through. Pull that down. I'm going to use the fingers of my left hand to slide that up to the very end. I'm going to pull on the long part. I'm going to pull on the short part. I'm pulling on both, and that locks that in real tightly. Then with my clippers, I'm going to clip off the short part of the Dacron backing and the short part of the fly line. And that is the Albright knot, which is extremely strong. That will probably never break on you. Something else will give before the Albright knot gives. All right, we have the Dacron on the reel. We have attached the fly line to the Dacron backing with a Albright knot. We're going to wind the whole fly line onto the reel now. I would just use a short piece so you can see what I'm doing, but you would be winding the whole fly line on. Leave about a foot of the fly line sticking out. Square the end of it up with your clippers. Okay, we're going to attach the leader to the fly line using a needle knot. I'm using a very small diameter needle sticking it in the very end of the fly line, bringing it back about an eighth of an inch. Use clippers, hemostats, whatever you have handy. Stick that out through the side of the fly line, about an eighth of an inch back in. Now obviously the end of the leader itself, the butt end, is too large to get through that small hole. So we use a single edge razor blade simply to shave that down shave it down for no other reason than to get it into the end of the fly line. Now see that has tapered that fat fly leader down to a small diameter. With the butt of the leader shaved down, I'm inserting that into the eye of the needle. Use your hemostats and pull that through. Now you have the butt of the leader actually entering into the center of the fly line itself. At this stage, we're going to attach that with a knot that we do call the needle knot, but I, it could be called a nail knot. Now, I cheat there. I go to a needle with a bigger eye, just simply because it's easier for me to see. Now, I like to put the big eyed needle right beside the very end of the fly line. Having this butt of the leader sticking through there about four inches, put the big eye needle right even with the end of the fly line. Wrap that leader material about four wraps around the line itself. Insert that back through the eye of the needle. Insert that end of the leader back through the eye of the needle. Then at this stage, you just simply pull the needle and that threads that right through the knot itself. Now here's a little trick that I think simplifies this whole knot technique. I use my thumbnails so those loops don't get away from me. See, I'm actually gonna slide it right back, but I'm sliding it and I'm using my thumbnails so those loops don't get away from me. So now I'm ready to clamp that down tightly. I go back to my tweezer hemostat needles and just pull on that. And that pulls that down tightly and that knot will last longer than a fly line will last. Use your clippers and clip off that little pigtail and you're ready to go. If you want to make that real smooth, you can put a couple small coats of ply bond on it. But that is a terrific knot, very, very strong. I'm going to show you an alternative to the blood knot for attaching mono to mono. I'm using red here just so you can see the tying steps. You let the two pieces overlap about three or four inches and tie a simple granny knot in which you pull the whole tip of the leader through there. That's basically just a granny knot. Then you go through there the second time and pull all four strands simultaneously. That pulls it down real tight, and that makes a very, very strong knot. Many people feel this is stronger than the blood knot, and almost everyone agrees that it's easier to tie than a blood knot. 
Double surge is not for attaching mono to mono. Now this leader that we have is the one we identify as the Murray's bright butt leader. We have five feet of fluorescent amnesia in the butt section. Then we jump down to clear mono from there on down. Uh, we like this because it helps detect the strike. It casts beautifully. And this is what we use for almost all of our smallmouth fishing, whether it's top water or underwater. Some of the fellows like to use clear leaders. You could use, instead of the two pieces of amnesia I have here, you could always also use Maxima. Maxima is an excellent butt material here. You'd start at 22 thousandths of an inch and just build the same leader. We sell those leaders. They're called the Murray's Classic Leaders. For my own personal fishing, I like two of those scientific angler indicators in there. I'm not wild about the floating indicators because they play tug of war with your nymph. So what I would do if I were going to use this leader myself, I'd leave the one on there. I'm going to get another scientific anchor indicator out of the package. And the easiest thing to do is just snip that little blood knot. And I'm going to slide this on up in the butt section. See, that's hollow, so it'll slide on. I'm holding that right there and just simply twisting it, and that goes right up in the butt section of that leader. Then the knot that I'm going to use here is the blood knot. Let them overlap about two to three inches on each side. I'm going to take the one on the far side, wrap that toward me, one, two, three, four wraps, and go through away from me. Take the one on the opposite side, one, two, three, four, and go through in the opposite direction. And if you're done it correctly, it should kind of set up like a scarecrow. Then pull that down tightly. After you've got it pulled securely, just get your clippers out and clip each one of those little wings off, and you're ready to go. So now we have the leader attached to the fly line with a needle knot. We have one scientific anger indicator in the butt section. We have another scientific anger indicator in the second strand down, and then that's tapered down each strand two thousandths of an inch smaller than the one above it, down to a 2x tipette. The tipette is the last portion of the leader. When you buy a leader, it is complete with a tipette. You never add tipette to an existing leader. Now, as you change flies, change flies, change flies, and that tipette gets shorter, you cut it off behind that knot and then add about another two feet of uh, tipette material back on. The knot for attaching the fly is probably equally important to attaching the tippette because you hit a big fish, either the tippette's going to break off or the fly is going to break off. The improved clinch is an excellent knot for this. I'm going to attach the fly to the tippette with an improved clinch knot. I'm using red mono here just so you can see what I'm doing. Stick the mono through there about four inches, make four wraps of the mono around the line itself, Stick that through in front of the eye. Take that little tag in and come up through the loop that you formed that you wrapped down. Then get a hold of the bug and get a hold of the leader and pull that down real tightly. You may have to use your thumbnails to encourage it to go down tightly. And then pull real, real tightly on that. Use your clippers to clip off the little tag in. And that is the improved clinch knot, which is very, very strong. Now, one trick we found in our schools that helps a whole lot is that about every 15 minutes when you're fishing, check this knot and check the knot that's attaching the tippet. The way we do that, I encourage my students to do it, and I do it for them when I'm working with, I'll get a hold of the leader above that knot, I'll get a hold of the fly out here and just pull. See, I can't even break that. If it's good and strong, you're home free. If either one breaks, then you retie it. That will save you many, many big fish. And try to do that about every 15 minutes when you're fishing. We've covered all of the techniques that we use in our smallmouth fishing here. I hope you can use this as a starting point for your fishing in your own streams, for the nymphs, the streamers, the topwater game. Use this in the way that you can find to your greatest advantage. Good luck in your own personal fishing.